Shout out. Those were shout out to Fontana. All right. Yeah, man, Thor, thank you for coming. So we're going to jump right into it, man. You have a lot of identities with you. Yeah. Right? Being Latino. Uh, your background being from San Bernardino, the IE, the Inland Valley of the IE. Going from that, and um, people say it's a rough environment and things like that. Working class environment as well. Going from that to being former mayor of, of Redlands, and I believe it's, uh, let me get this correct. Correct me if I'm wrong. U.S. Representative of California's 31st Congressional District? Yeah, it's a long title. Right, yeah, something like that. Um, having all these things, how do they all kind of like emerge together, and what do you think your role is in your position now? Because you do represent all of these different identities. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, and I think the person who I am and, and who I, uh, how I go about, you know, how I define leadership, what I choose to focus my time and energy on to help people in this district, I think it's all shaped by my identity and my culture and how I was raised and, and how I grew up. And it's probably, you know, pretty similar to you and, and, and thousands of other kids out here in this region. My parents and grandparents were all born and raised in San Bernardino or Colton, um, um, fourth generation. Um, but, you know, I also kind of struggled from an identity perspective, I think, because my, my parents didn't speak Spanish. Um, then my grandparents kept them away from Spanish uh, when they were in school because they were going uh, to school, you know, during a time when, you know, if you were brown, you hung out over there. And if you were black, you hung out over there. And the white kids hung out here. And so they didn't want them, you know, they didn't want uh, the life that they had to be impacted by them. Now, we view it as a strength, right? Like, like speaking Spanish, being multicultural, it, those are all solid strengths that, that we teach our kids. But for them growing up, they tried to shield us you know, from that aspect of it because they had experienced you know, racism. They had experienced you know, the deep divide of, of growing up uh, in this area that has been evolving. It was like white working class you know, 50, 60 years ago, and now is majority minority. You know, uh, in this congressional district, 60%, over 60% of people are either uh, black or Latin. And so it is a changing and evolving area. But so I think my style and how I go about things, you know, kind of reflects that. And sometimes may reflect a little bit of that kind of uncertainty. Like yeah. how I grew up in San Bernardino, you know, not speaking Spanish. Uh, my parents moved because San Bernardino was, was having a tough time. Um, they moved us to Kaipa. And I go to school for the first day and I see two kids, you know, taking their horses to school. And like, how do you go from school in San Bernardino right. to like kids riding horses to go to middle school? And you know, a uh, mostly you know probably ninety percent Caucasian at that point. And so, just um, and and I mean, uh, to be honest with you, I mean, I've never really dug down you know uh, to that to that level. But it is it has kind of shaped me. Um, I think the strengths are that it has allowed me and it continues to allow me to kind of understand where people come from. Um, but I think it also kind of reflects uh, sometimes um, a struggle that, that I have, um, you know, with you know how I define myself um, and and feeling, you know, uh, I do feel there's guilt associated with not speaking Spanish. Um, but I do think that that I, I wouldn't change anything. Obviously, you know, I'm in a position to be able to, to help a lot of people. Um, but there, there has been you know, those divides. But growing up as a kid, man, I mean, that's the stuff that I love was, was everybody lived within a couple miles of each other. Right. Uh, my cousins were on 28th and, and, and Waterman across the street from us. I was on Alexander between 27th and 28th. We would always hang out with each other. Um, uh, it sounds bad, but all the guys would hang out, my uncles and my dad would hang out in the front yard washing cars. Yeah, um, yeah. And my grandmother and aunts and, and mom, they'd, they'd be cooking and taking care of the kids and hanging out. Um, but it was like this deep, every Saturday or Sunday, it was just like, where are we going? Like, right. oh, are we hosting it? Oh, okay, great. Or we're going to Uncle Peppers, we're going to Uncle Manuel's, we're going right. to like, um, so, you know, that was, that was always, you know, very evident. It's like the closeness of, of community um, and how it shapes you and that your family is always there for you. So those have been like four values of me. And I, I'm not gonna lie; it has. I mean, it's led to some issues that that, that I've had to kind of deep, you know, deep down and, and really think through as well. Yeah, and that's uh, another thing I, I was thinking of. Cause when we first met in, in D.C. in May, 
I was like, well, this is the first kind of like brown dude from the IE in this office I've ever seen. Like, it's kind of weird. Like, I could barely handle being here, and you're at a very higher place, right? And so, how, how are some, I don't know, I, I guess like what comes with that, right? Like, you're in a good position now, yeah. and you have a position to make change. Um, we always talk about, on, at least on this campus, about the powers that be, right? So we're all woke, we all know what we want to see change, the education system, the school prison pipeline, all these type of things. But you're kind of in a position yeah. to help push for these, for these type of things. So what are some way, like what are your views on, on a lot of tendencies that lead kids from these certain areas that like you, grew, you and I grew up in to these unfortunate incidences? And it's not a coincidence, right? you know? Well, and it, it's tough, and uh, because it's a it, it's a tough conversation for a community to have, because you have to talk about you know poverty, you have to talk about you know tough tough issues, uh, poverty, opportunity, uh, access to, to education. Um, you have to confront the real issue that not every kid in our in our region in our area has that opportunity to, to succeed. Uh, that some kids um, go to, to schools that, that aren't as good for them. Um, and don't give them that opportunity. Um, and it isn't the fault of, of these kids. Um, so how do we change that? How do we make that change? I mean, to answer your question, it's a it, it's it's a huge you know it's a huge weight. I mean, it's a, it's expectations. I feel it's responsibility. I feel uh, to make positive change. Um, I feel thankful that, that I don't I don't believe anybody's told me you know you got to make these changes in a, in a two year congressional term. Or I was on the city council mayor for. for eight years at the city, you know, two years in Congress now, um, and, you know, I know it takes time, but we've got to address these issues, we've got to talk about it, we've got to figure out what some of these root causes are, uh, we've got to build coalitions of stakeholders, we've got to get parents involved to say, my kid deserves a fair shot, we have to elect school board members that look like the community in which they serve, we've got to elect city council members that look like the communities in which they serve, uh, school superintendents, um, you know, all of these folks you know, have to be representative of the community, and they have to look out for the entire community. And that might mean that they have to, you know, confront issues as well um, within the region. And, 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 and maybe it's it's the, the quality of, of of teachers. Maybe it's the tra uh, how transient students are. You know, we always want to give. You know, we always want to take shots at teachers, and some people want to take shots at teachers. Uh, because their kids aren't performing well, you know what's the truancy rate in that class? A teacher can't control, you know, how many times that kid doesn't come to, to school or school year, um, and they're just expected to teach them and to get them to take take a test well, um, you know, every couple months. And that's that's not fair. So we've got to con confront some of the, the ways we've always done things, um, um, but do it in a way that continues to evolve, and change, and learn, and be respectful of how multicultural this community. Yeah, so going even deeper into that, uh, specifically within the school system, uh, which is a big emphasis on what I try to focus on, I think that's the biggest way that you do change now and later, right, is from youth. Um, and like you said, everyone tries to blame the teacher a lot of times, like this is, you know, this is why the school is failing and things like that. Um, some blame the parents, you know, well, if you, you know, raise your kid right, they would come to school and perform and things like that. Some blame the, the admin in the district and, and so many variables that involve uh, an institution in the education system, right? So what are some things that you think are the most important to focus on and what do you think needs to change? Yeah, I mean, specific, specific to the classroom, I think the most important is that everybody feels they have to be accountable to somebody else. So like student, uh, students need to be you know, held accountable to each other, parents need to be held accountable for the student, um, teachers need to be uh, held accountable for for the instruction that they're giving. Um, administrators need to be held accountable by policy makers um, and by teachers. Um, everybody's got to feel that, that someone uh, is pushing them. Someone is pushing them to be better and to do more. But, you know, the, the, the root of this is, look, I mean, the, the family structure doesn't look the way it did 60 years ago. Um, people are working harder, they're working longer, and they're getting paid less. Um, so oftentimes you have single, single parent households as well. Um, so mom or dad doesn't have as much time. Um, you have elder siblings who are responsible for younger siblings. So they've got to do their homework and then they've got to help their younger siblings do homework. Um, well, look, I mean, you know, that's not the way to cookie cutter and, 
and, and all the magazines look like in the 1950s, but that's just the way our family structure is. So we've got to make sure that the parents have good paying jobs. We've got to make sure that that, that support system is there for families. Uh, I've focused a lot on you know the poverty aspect, on student nutrition. Um, you know, if someone, if a young person is going to school, let's say an elementary school kid is going to school hungry, um, or the one meal that they get every day is that is that free lunch from school. Um, you know, how, are you, how do you expect them to do well at 10 a.m. before the lunch when there's the, they, the last time they ate was at noon the day before? I mean, we've got to confront this stuff. We've got to talk about it. You know, the fact that 25% that of school kids uh, in this district, in our community, um, you know, live below the poverty line. Um, the fact that many of them go, go to school hungry. Um, you know, these are real, real issues. Uh, San Bernardino did a study where they found um, that it was over 60, 70 percent of, of elementary school kids had what they would classify as a dental emergency. So they've got a toothache or they've got, man, I'm a baby. So like, if, if I got a toothache, I'm going to the doctor like, the next day. <laughs> like, I can't, I can't take it. But like, I'm in a position where I can do that. Right. right? Exactly. So, and, and you are too. We have insurance. We have these things. What if you're a student that doesn't have that? Right. Um, so, what if what if you're you know what if you're in a position where you have gotta tolerate that that tooth uh, and you're you know you're, you're changing things, but you know you're asked to study, you're asked to read and memorize this stuff, and you just can't you can't stop thinking about your toothache. I mean, you know, look, it's an extreme example, but I mean these are real life things that, that our community is going through, and we've got to figure out how to address each one, how to build a support network for for our for our young kids to give them that opportunity. But everybody's got to be accountable to, some, to, to someone else within the community. So uh, I partnered with the city of San Bernardino. They applied for a grant. We were helpful. Uh, they got a two million to two point nine million dollar grant uh, for eleven police officers uh, within the city of San Bernardino. Uh, that's a big deal. We're continuing to look at grants and programs for them. Um, so uh, they got an officer. We helped them uh, on a grant so officers can wear uh, body cameras as well. Uh, so this is an issue that helps uh, people in our community. So we know uh, what's going on. So we have access to, to what these officers see and do. Now I'm gonna challenge you on this. Okay. And yeah. I think a lot of people from my community that are my age, um, and they have possibly experienced similarities. Um, when I hear the the thought of okay, more policing means more protection, I get scared. I mean, I grew up not foreign to the thought that police can be bad people, and it's and it's a militarized institution and things like that. So. The thought of more police being a help is a is a fright to to people where I'm from, and this is the community that was approved that the police was approved for. So I, I just want to know, like, why do you think that that that? Helps? Well, they got to do it the right way. Look, I mean, and and, and I, I really do believe you know 99 you know 9 percent of, of of cops are doing it for the right reasons and they're doing the right things. Um, but but just just like with any profession, there's going to be people that don't. That, that don't do it for the right reasons and don't do it the right way. Now, by cops, we're not we're not talking we're talking about community policing. You know, getting getting groups uh, engaged with their officers. Not every young person like you and I should have a negative experience. A first experience with a cop shouldn't be negative, right? I mean, it should be community policing, going to schools, letting people know you know that you're there for them. I mean, right. that, that's the right way to do it. Right. And and so sometimes they need you know they need more bodies, they need more people in order to do that because they're going to tell you. Uh, well, look, we've got eight people in cars right now. They're just responding to phone calls, right? They're yeah. just driving from phone call to phone call. Yeah. You know, for them to go to a school, to, to interact with kids, to get a positive experience with our youth, you know, that's another person that they need. Right. And that's real. I mean, that's that's a, that's a real issue. So, so how do we help that? How do we build that bridge between the community? Um, you know, you do it, you know, one at a time. You do it by, by asking them to be accountable to the community. And by putting them in a position where they have to do town halls, they have to do other things you know, with the community. Um, but I hear you, and that's why the body camera stuff was important for me, right? Because that's an that's an area where when you see you know uh, people of color uh, uh, on TV uh, who are victims of, of violence uh, by police officers, you know we, we see that you need that accountability, and that's just where there's a, you know a news helicopter above them or something, right? Like, so I think that's well, that's an investment that we need to make, and that's a grant we need to do at the federal level. Is you know because if, if you call the police and, and, and 
and then they come and then something happens, you know, you say, hey, the, this cop is bad. You know, we need to be able to pull that camera out and say, look, like, like, did something bad happen or not? Um, I think that's something that helps all of us. So, so I mean, I hear you, and believe me, look, I, I, took, I took three breathalyzers uh, before the age of 21, getting pulled over. Um, in a in a you know in a white community, um, I took three breathalyzers. Why? I don't know. I mean, they said I was going you know forty five and a forty or something. Um, <laughs> but they pulled me over. I took I took you know three breathalyzers and never I didn't drink and drive. And so, but that's that was my negative experience um, with with police. And so uh, you know it it happens and it's real. But you know, I think in order to, to confront that, we've got to give we've got to give them the benefit of the doubt that they are overworked. Um, and in order for them to do the outreach things that we want them to do, um, we got to give them a little bit of help. And and knocking doors and talking to people in San Bernardino and Colton, uh, when I ask people, are you comfortable with you know having 11 more police officers and the city's added you know more than more beyond that, you know, is that okay with you? You know, people are people are okay with that. People know that, that you know over 50 uh, homicides in San Bernardino right now. People know that they're they're being you know overrun. Uh, this is a problem, and it's a problem with gangs and it's a problem with guns, and it's something that we need to confront. And we need to talk about. So one last question: um, Trump is elected. What are your thoughts? Uh, I'm I'm not happy about it. I mean, obviously, I was a uh, I'm a Clinton I was a Clinton supporter. Um, you know, it's just I'm I'm very sad. By what I think are going to be uh, policies that he proposes, uh, I'm willing to give the president-elect an opportunity. Uh, right now, I think he's got a limited opportunity to surround himself with reasonable people um, and to really focus on things that we can work on together: um, infrastructure, jobs, uh, helping inner cities. You know, these are things he talked about. Tax reform. These are things he talked about on the campaign trail. Um, if he wants to talk about those. You know, I'm going to have an open arm. Um, if he wants to talk about Muslim registries, uh, de deporting, um, uh, uh, tearing apart families um, here in our community, um, if he wants to talk about you know, appointing attorney generals who have uh, what, what have been called you know, racist tendencies or a white nationalist you know, is at the top of his staff, you know, these are things I'm going to have huge concern about. And I'm going to call him on it each and every time. And we're not going to win all of these fights. We just aren't. But you know, it's, it's important for me to use my voice, my opportunity uh, to be able to convey that I think that some of this behavior is, is going to be uh, um, uh, in the wrong interest of this country. Uh, and then to those people who, who have a concern about this, um, you know, it's on us to, to take action. It's on us to, to, to you know, uh, use um, uh, the tools that we have um, to, to, to peacefully protest um, and to peacefully have our voices heard, to write letters to the editor to organize, to sign petitions, um, to do those types of things that are really the core of what democracy stands for. Uh, but we've got to hold this president accountable, and we've got to let him know that he has a unique opportunity um, to bring this country together. Uh, but if he doesn't see it, or if he doesn't choose to do that, uh, then we need to hold him accountable, and we need to be there to, to be loud uh, for our communities. Anything else you'd like to add? No, I'm good, man. I'm good. I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, man. Always.